I think we have to look at the tax code almost as how we look at a winding river that deposits mud on the side of a bank. It's, it's a process of accretion. So when people think about taxes in America and they think about this huge tax code, and of course the politicians have been yammering for decades about how it's so complicated, we need to reform it, we need to do this and that. And of course it never happens, it's never simplified. Uh, and that's because there's no coherent viewpoint that's gone into the tax code. It's simply the result of lobbyists and interests over decade and decade and decade, you know, glomming onto it with their particular deduction or trying to tax the other industry to disadvantage it, trying to find a loophole for your industry. So what it's become and what it operates as today is sort of a reign of terror. It's so uncertain. In other words, what taxes you owe and how much it is so difficult to ascertain. You can go to two different tax professionals not lay people, not preparing it yourself. You can go to two different tax professionals and get two different answers as to what you owe. So what this creates is a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And uncertainty is, is a wonderful tool of terror for government because if people don't exactly know, they, they fear something. And so even though they may not be audited, they, their tax return might pass muster just fine, there's always that sort of idea in the back of their head that they've heard about someone who was ruined by an audit or they've heard about someone who went to jail for not paying their taxes. And so even though that might be statistically a tiny percentage of the population, it, it's a tremendous uh, leverage tool for government to just scare you and to make you comply once a year with this sort of spectacle, this complex uh, process by which you file your taxes and pay accountants and, and worry and fret. So it's, it's really an astonishing thing. So at, at this point, regardless of what the intention was, regardless of what politicians say, what the tax code acts as is, is a regulator. It's a way to, uh, to ensure that Americans are docile and that Americans are frightened of their government because that's the number one interaction most people have with the federal government is their annual tax form. So it, it's a remarkable thing. And it, you know, obviously we can all see the sheer evil of it. And, and you don't necessarily need to have a malicious intent on the part of any single lawmaker who wrote part of the tax code. You, you know, the, the net effect of it today is, is that it's, it's, a form of, it's a form of terror. Well, yes and no. Uh, I had a lot of tax clients and some of them were guilty <laughs> in the sense that uh, they, they committed the act that they were alleged to have committed and they intentionally did so. But I had some that were also just caught up in the net um, but through simple malfeasance or through, through a simple a, a mistake. You know, they weren't sophisticated people. They had heard from a friend that you could deduct this or something like that. Uh, or sometimes they were just people who had let their taxes go for several years because they were in, in a terrible situation in their personal lives. They were maybe struggling with a small business or they were going through a nasty divorce. And so uh, when they were dealing with all these other things in life, their tax compliance got sidetracked. They get a little behind penalties and interest start to ramp up and all of a sudden they find themselves sort of behind the eight ball and owing the IRS a ton of money. Uh, I did have the opportunity to go visit a client in federal prison. This was in downtown San Diego in a big high rise nondescript building that was just amongst a bunch of office towers. So you hardly even notice it as a pedestrian. But when you go inside, uh, let me tell you something, you, you, you may hear about club fed or something, but this prison was no joke. Even visiting it was scary. And just the windowless nature of it, the, the noise, the sheer uh, din of all the inmates in their various tiers uh, was something I'll never forget. So the, the idea that we are putting people in places like that uh, for not paying their tribute to the king, as it were, uh, is something that really ought to give us pause. And, and you know, if, if nothing else, I think that uh, we, we could all argue, maybe across the aisle, across these goofy political parties, that you know, tax uh, matters should be a, a civil fine at most. In other words, you should never go and, and lose your actual physical liberty. You should never go to jail for, for not paying the tribute. Um, I, I wish that concept had more legs. In other words, I wish more people saw it as a victim, victimless crime like libertarians do. Uh, you know, from a pure libertarian perspective, not only is, a vict is it a victimless crime, so-called, uh, to not give the federal government money, it's actually heroic. In other words, you're withholding revenue and power from an organization, an institution of theft, an institution of murder, uh, 
an institution of war, and that if it has uh, you know a few uh, few less resources because of you not paying your taxes, quote unquote, in a sense you've done something heroic because you have not contributed uh, to this machine. Well, clearly, and it's self-evident that taxes are just another cost of doing business, and those costs are passed through to the consumer. Uh, the corporations don't pay taxes. Uh, business entities don't pay taxes. Only, only people pay taxes because a tax is, is, a, is a burden. It's, it's something that we bear almost in a physical, visceral sense. Uh, you know, the government doesn't take your finger or your arm. It doesn't take your firstborn, but it takes your money. And, and not only does it lord that over you, but your, your money represents almost a form of energy. You worked hard and you earned some money in exchange. And so when, when government comes along and takes part of that away from you without your consent, it's almost taking part of your life, some of your, your vital life force, your energy, the, the, the energy that you uh, uh, put forth to, to create that income. And so, you know, when we, when we think about it that way, it's clear that only individuals really bear the, the uh, hardship of taxes. So we shouldn't think of businesses and corporations as taxpayers. It, it's, it's a cost of doing business uh, no different than uh, other forms of overhead, their, their payroll, their utilities, their buildings. Uh, and, and that's the way to think about it. And so we've allowed uh, government to sort of get away with this idea that like, well, the, those big corporations ought to pay it. And, and that, that's just ridiculous. Corporations are nothing more than their owners and shareholders. And those are individual flesh and blood people, and that's who pays taxes. About a trillion dollars goes to Social Security, about a trillion dollars goes to Medicare, a tad less. And regardless of whether they admit it or not, through all sources, about a trillion dollars goes to the so-called defense budget. Now that not only includes the six or seven hundred billion to DOD, but also State Department, a lot of US aid, a lot of other things uh, in the federal budget are, are really defense spending masquerading as something else. So just Social Security, Medicare, and, and defense are $3 trillion right off the bat. So all the other things we think the federal government does for us, like building roads, uh, really represents a very small portion of what the federal government spends. And so anyone, whether they're a libertarian or not, who say, well, government's too big and we need to cut spending. If they're not talking about defense, if they're not talking about entitlements, they're not being serious. There, there's no amount of cutting we could do in any other part of the government that would make a meaningful difference in, in you know, an annual deficit or in, or in the greater debt. So this is, this, is, this is a very unserious subject. And we ha I think as libertarians, we ought to look at it that way. The, what, the, the way it's being discussed is unserious. And we should mock it and we should view it for what it is, which is sort of a smokescreen uh, for you know, just a, an unbelievable a crazed government that spends so wildly beyond its its means. And I will say this, um, a certain percentage of, the, of federal spending every year is deficit financed. Uh, maybe, the, it, you know, right now it's more than half a billion dollars, uh, more than, excuse me, more than half a trillion dollars. So uh, the amount of tax revenue that government takes in doesn't cover everything it spends. And so to make up the difference, obviously they sell treasury debt. So uh, you know, as, as bizarre as it sounds, if a, if a portion of the federal government's budget can be funded by debt, arguably the whole thing could be. We could have no income taxes and the four trillion dollars that the U.S. Fed Gov spends every year could, could be uh, financed via, via treasury debt and then ultimately monetized by the Fed. And this is in a funny way, uh, kind of what the MMTers are arguing, the modern monetary theory people, uh, that uh, we can just use debt to finance the government and the government can always create more money and more debt. So um, it, it's interesting that um, in, in a sense, government could be financed with debt, at least the US government, because there's for the moment still a market for our treasury offerings. Uh, so why are they taxing us at all? That, that's a good question. I think it goes back to the idea of taxes as a tool of compliance and terror. Well, without taxes, we would spend our money in, in what we think of as more win-win rational ways. We would buy what we want. We would buy certain services from the market that we are, are, are currently uh, allegedly or supposedly provided by government, like defense, police, fire, obviously roads. 
uh, education. And if all those things were purchased by people on the market, they would be far more responsive. They would be far more efficient. They'd be far cheaper. And, and we'd all be wealthier. There's, there's no question about it. The, the amount of waste in government, even if you believe that those services are essential or can only be provided by government as a so-called public good, even if you believe and accept that, I, I think even uh, uh, the, the most general critic of government would acknowledge that there's a tremendous amount of waste because there's not the profit and loss incentive. There's not skin in the game as Nassim Taleb says. These are people spending money that isn't theirs, and no one will ever spend that money as carefully as they spend their own. So uh, it, it really comes down to whether one believes uh, the Rothbardian argument for full privatization of services that can be purchased on the market, and that even comes down to courts and police and national defense. And I think there's very strong arguments that the answer to all three of those is yes that courts can be private. We see that every day in, in uh, private adjudication systems, uh, in arbitration systems. Uh, police, we see that every day in the form of security, uh, private security at places like Disneyland. And as far as national defense goes, I think it's largely a myth. I don't think that the rest of the world is particularly looking to uh, come invade America. And uh, even if it was, I think that uh, the, the notion that security could be provided uh, on the marketplace is, is something that's absolutely tenable and that, that we need to look at. So even when it comes to these core functions of government uh, that even conservatives or minarchists or whomever believe in, um, I, I, I'm not convinced, but I'm absolutely convinced that if everyone had 100% of their income to spend as they wished, that they could buy these things and that if they want these things, a market would arise for these things and, and it would be private and better, cheaper, faster. Well, it's an absolute travesty. Clearly, tariffs are just taxes and they're also highly regressive taxes. In other words, poorer people tend to pay a much higher percentage of their income on basic goods, uh, you know, stuff they buy at Walmart. A $5 pair of flip-flops becomes $6. And if somebody makes a hundred grand a year or two hundred thousand a year, that's a very minor irritation. If somebody makes uh, fifteen thousand dollars a year, you know, uh, and cumulatively you add up, you know, over what they spend in a year at Walmart, a dollar here and there adds up very quickly and has an actual meaningful impact on their life. And of course, it all goes back to this mercantilist fetish. We we fetishize exports over imports. And this is something that plagues economics. It's something that plagues politics. And, and of course, it, it, it uh, manifests itself in, in our ridiculous uh, concept of GDP, which it considers consumption even by, and spending even by government as part of the calculation. And it nets out exports over imports. So uh, GDP rises uh, with, with when, when exports exceed imports. And of course, this is just absolute nonsense. We get richer by getting cheap stuff abroad that other countries can make more efficiently and cheaper than us. Uh, and it's not something we should worry about. It's something we should celebrate. We should say, hey, isn't that great that Americans are working on robotics or AI or tech or software and not making $5 flip-flops all day? You know, we can make, just let Vietnam or, or China make $5 flip-flops. This is something we should celebrate and, and say that, you know, isn't it great that our economy allows for you know, uh, less affluent folks, poorer folks, to, to buy all these cheap goods at a place like Walmart. That's, that's an absolute win for Americans. And so when Trump or anybody else wants to slap tariffs on these imports, th this isn't just something where we're talking about the domestic steel industry versus the Japanese steel industry. We're talking about people who live close to the bone. You know, people who are, are buying things with AFDC and WIC and food stamps, um, and, you know, when, especially when it comes to agricultural goods, we should never, ever accept a tariff. I mean, it, it's an absolute tragedy, and it's a hidden tragedy because uh, so many Americans don't understand it and they don't see it. They view it in, in patriotic or jingoistic terms uh, when they ought to be looking at their neighbors and saying, you know, I, I, I don't want to, to uh, vote to take a dollar out of their pocket. Well, I think there would be lawyers even in a free society. I think there would still be uh, conflicts. I think there would still be contracts that would occasionally be breached. I think there would still be disputes between neighbors, disputes amongst in, in business. I think there's a, there's a lot of ways in which lawyers would still be a thing. Uh, 
in a, in a private society it might still have a market function in drafting contracts and representing people in what we would hope would be some form of common law courts or private courts or private arbitration, uh, that you wouldn't have all the, the kinds of lawyers who deal with the government. Um, and I think criminal law would look very, very different. It would be a restitutionary model. And so, uh, you know, there might be a case where you have a jury and, and uh, someone who's harmed uh, a, a, another family, let's say through murder or something, would have to uh, have some form of lifetime restitution. But we wouldn't be putting people in little tiny cages and spending $50,000 a year on their, uh, their care and maintenance in those cages. It, it's obviously an absurd system. So lawyering would look very different, but I, I still think that there would be a, a function for, for attorneys in, in a freer society. But isn't that interesting? It, it clearly doesn't. I mean, in any theory of law or contract, there's, there's express contract, implied contract, there's oral and written contract. So clearly, uh, none of us signed the Constitution. Um, and none of us signed on to any of the laws that are on the books unless we happen to be an actual you know, local or state or federal legislator. Uh, and, and so clearly, there's no written or express form of of acquiescence or acceptance by the general public to any of these supposed terms that to which we've agreed. I mean, it's clear that there is no express contract, there's no written contract. I don't think that's arguable. Uh, the social contract theory people argue that there's an implied contract. Uh, okay, well, let's think about that. An implied contract in contract law basically means that through the actions of the two parties involved, they've basically demonstrated the terms of a contract, um, you know, through either through their actions or forbearance. That's pretty sketchy. That's actually pretty specious when one party has guns and jails and laws and taxes to enforce uh, the contract on the other side. Um, you, you start to wonder just how uh, valid the, these terms are because uh, there's, a, there's a concept in common law called an ad ad adhesion contract where one party has so much economic power over the other that even though they may have agreed, uh, even in writing, to a contract, it, it ought to be null and void almost because of the power imbalance between the two. And, and really, government versus the individual represents the biggest adhesion contract possible. Um, you know, you can say, well, in social contract theory, because you stay in America and you don't move away, uh, and because you don't uh, go try to run for office yourself, or because you don't muster a gang to try to overrun City Hall or overrun your state legislature or overrun uh, Washington, D.C., that, that because you sort of sit there and peaceably get up and go about your day every day and go to work and, and don't make too much noise, that you've agreed to all of this and that this represents an implied contract. Again, given the power imbalance, given the tanks and the guns and the jails and the taxes, I, I think it's just an absurd argument. And obviously, personally, I, I, I'm with Lysander Spooner on this. And I, I, think, th I think the whole thing's just absolute bunk. Uh, th this, is, this is something you're born into. And, and, and let's not forget, again, let's go back to the less affluent folks, poorer folks, the, you know, why don't you move to X? Um, that, that's not an argument for people who live awfully close to the bone in, in their personal finances. I mean, the, the, for, for plenty of people, even moving across town, even uh, coming up with the uh, deposit for a new apartment and the security deposit for new utilities and that sort of thing is a daunting task. I mean, we can see that amongst our homeless population. So the idea that by not leaving and by not uh, necessarily engaging in politics, by not making a ruckus that you've agreed to all this is absolute nonsense. I think the answer is, to the latter is no. Uh, a, a contract has elements. You go to law school, you're gonna hear all about elements of a tort or elements of a crime or elements of a contract. So the elements of contract are basically offer and acceptance. That means the two, one party makes an offer uh, maybe there's a counter offer made, but at some point the two parties come to an agreement, a meeting of the minds. That's called offer and acceptance. And then there's consideration, which is generally uh, the thing that each side gives up to the other. In, in a typical business contract, let's say one party agrees to provide some services and the other side agrees to give some money. So that's the consideration. I'm giving my time and my skill to provide a service for you and you're giving me some money that has some value. So that's, that's the consideration. And then you get into the performance element of the contract. The two parties perform it, at least roughly according to the terms, and hopefully 
it all works out and everyone's happy and there's no fallout or litigation. Uh, you know, sometimes this is the case, sometimes it isn't. But these elements, especially the offer and acceptance and the consideration, uh, aren't aren't available in, in your relationship with the government. They didn't offer. So when a young person reaches an age of, of consciousness uh, where they might be able to uh, reasonably think about and read about the nature of government for themselves, uh, their friendly local city councilman or congressman or, who, or governor or whomever doesn't come over and say, well, hello, young citizen X, pleased to meet you. Uh, I'd like to offer you my governmental services, which will include road and police and fire and courts and, and, and uh, colleges and all kinds of wonderful things. And in exchange, uh, here, here's some contract terms. If, if you sign this, you're, you, know, you agree, let's say at the state level, to pay an 8% annual income tax, and there'll be some sales and property taxes along with it, but you know, it's all gonna work out swimmingly for you, and you're really gonna like this. And so this, this young person takes a look at it and says, well, you know, uh, that's interesting. I, you know, I, I appreciate this and you haven't stuck a gun in my face, at least yet, but I, I'd like to shop around a bit. Well, well, well hold on a minute. It, it turns out there is no shopping around and it turns out there is no Amazon and there is no Walmart and there is no uh, uh, Honda Accord versus the Tesla versus the Toyota Camry. It turns out that this uh, contract being offered to you is kind of one-sided. Uh, we have a, mon a monopoly provider uh, of, for these services. And it turns out that the price you're going to pay for these services can be changed almost at will by the service provider himself and, and his cronies in the uh, legislature. So all this would be a very odd uh, form of contract uh, for, for most people. And then if it turns out that e even, even when you couldn't shop around, you couldn't even say no. In other words, if this young person said, you know, even though I can't shop around, I've decided I'm going to go without your friendly services. I don't need them and I'm going to uh, get by on my own. And I'm going to go live out in the woods by myself and I'm not going to use your roads and I'm not going to use your schools. I'm not going to use your fire and police and, I, and I'm not going to pay. Uh, that sounds fair, right? I'm not using your services, what you're trying to impose upon me. Well, it turns out that even then, no, you still have to pay your 8% tribute as a citizen of state X. So this is a very odd form of contract if we look at it that way. And of course, uh, you know, you look at it at the federal level, it's the same thing. And each individual who comes into to life here in America who's born is so far removed from this whole process. We're all so attenuated from the, the supposed founding in this country, from the Constitution, from the enabling statutes that the states pass uh, to, to allow a state to allow local and county governments to operate. I mean, the whole thing is so far away from us, uh, from our day to day lives in a country of 320 million people that uh, to, 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 to say that this represents a contract, express or implied, is in my view just absurd. To me, anarchy is just normal life that happens all around us every day. Um, when we walk down the street, uh, we all have a vested interest in just having society where we deal with one another peaceably and we deal with one another in ways that we feel are justified and win-win. I mean, anarchy is just, is just in the air around us. It's not uh, something abstract. It's just human beings doing what they want to do voluntarily. Well, without force, without coercion. That doesn't mean that there's not psychopaths in the world. It doesn't mean that there aren't malevolent actors in the world who might try to rob and cheat and kill and defraud. Uh, but, but it means that most of us don't want to do that, those things, because it's not in our interest. It's in our interest to live peaceably uh, because it's only in a peaceable society where we can trade with one another and that our material well-being can rise to the level uh, of the wondrous, decent society we see all around us. So I would say uh, anarchy is basically the absence of government and nothing more and nothing less. Um, government's just another form of criminality. It's a particularly organized one and a particularly powerful one. You could call it the biggest gang and the most dominant gang. Uh, but it's, when we talk about government uh, as, as the alternative to anarchy or as the antidote to anarchy, I think that's really backwards. I think that uh, anarchy is really uh, peace and voluntarism, and I, and I think government is force and fraud and, and, and death and killing and jailing and taxing and taking and stealing and robbing. Um, so really, 
Anarchy is our natural state. It, it, it does not mean chaos. It means the absence of rulers. Anarchy is what organizes spontaneously around us. Anarchy allows for rules. Anarchy allows for security. Anarchy allows for courts and, and to address theft and fraud and crime. Uh, anarchy is, is not some chaotic state. What we, what we have right now is state anarchy. Unlike all the strictures imposed on us by states, states themselves are chaotic. States aren't required to follow any rules. There's no rule of law. That's a mythology that we cling to. Um, states can do what they want and they are the judge of their own actions. They're the judge of their own criminality. They're the judge of their own civil penalties. I mean, this is a, a bizarre state of affairs where, where maybe 1% of the population, 3 million or so federal employees, uh, get to dictate to the other uh, 329 million of us how things are going to be. And they're the sole arbiter of their own actions. Um, this, to me, is chaotic. Uh, and uh, Robert Higgs talks about this with the concept of regime uncertainty. It's government that gives us chaos. It's markets and civil society that give us tradition and peace and cooperation and markets and, in, in, and society itself. Civilization itself comes from markets and civil society. It's government that gives us chaos. Well, it's an interesting question, isn't it? It's the Stockholm Syndrome. And, and we all, I think, are a little susceptible to this. I don't think we should pat ourselves on the back too quickly as libertarians. I mean, uh, but what's interesting is if we compare and contrast this with the mafia, with organized cr criminal uh, organizations in the United States, especially turn of the century and not too long after in, in eastern cities like New York and, and, and in Philadelphia and in Chicago, uh, oftentimes uh, mafia organizations had uh, quite a bit of loyalty and almost endearment from the public uh, because they were viewed as benefactors. And, and in many cases, uh, they were benefactors in the sense that if you paid tribute to your local mafia, and let's say you were a shopkeeper, your store really was immune from any further theft. I mean, in other words, they wanted to protect their, their turf, which was you, and they were skimming, let's say, 10% off, of off of your revenue. And so when you paid that 10% to the mafia or the organized crime in, in your town, you actually didn't have to worry about the, the you know, private shoplifters coming in and taking from you because they were terrified. In other words, they at least provided security, real security in exchange for the tribute that they paid. Uh, you, you know, with, with, our, with government today, as, as we all know, police just sort of come after the fact after you call them and mop up and take a criminal report. They don't prevent crime for the most part. So, so it's interesting that uh, in, in some ways, um, you know, even your local mafia was, was perhaps uh, was more aligned with your interests uh, as a shopkeeper in, in providing real protection in exchange for the tribute. There was an actual service that you got. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, arguably there's very few services that we get from government today that are efficient or effective, and oftentimes they're very counterproductive. Uh, so it, when, when someone talks about loyalty to, to government or, or, or participating in the system, you know, to the libertarian ear, it sounds very odd. It sounds very strange, but we can understand it. Uh, people want to go along and get along. It's part of human nature. People want to be part of their country. People want to feel uh, patriotic. People, people want to view the government as a benign thing because it's, it's uncomfortable psychologically to view government as Rothbard views it. That's not an easy thing for most people, and that's okay. I don't think we should beat people up over that. It, it takes a bit of an awakening. It's, it's, a, it's a rough pill to swallow in many ways, but once you do, I think that you, you understand the system for what it is. I have no problem with tactical voting. I certainly have no problem with not voting. I think that's something that you should, you should just determine for yourself based on your local circumstances. But uh, loyalty is something I think you give to friends and family and, and loved ones. I don't think it's something you give to a criminal gang.